Thanks, Amanda. Candice, thank you so much for being here with me today. I especially appreciate you being here even as the season is underway, uh, but I can truly think of few better people to talk to about Title IX and its impact on sports than you. Uh, so you've marked the 50th anniversary of these protections in a really big way with the documentary Title IX, 37 Words That Changed America, which you produced. I definitely want to talk about that, but I'd first like to back up a little bit and ask, do you remember the first time that you heard of Title IX? I do. It's so interesting. Um, in doing the documentary, 37 Words, that we'll later talk about, um, you know, we came across an article that was in one of our scrapbooks, and it was a Title IX article when I was a sophomore in high school. And I remember doing a paper on Title IX in middle school. Um, so I have always been, you know, you know, well-versed in this topic, as well as I attended University of Tennessee. And, we, you know, a lot of us basketball players, they are definitely minored in Title IX with Coach Summit as our, as our head coach. Um, she made sure that we knew, you know, all we needed to about it. So in, in the documentary, you talk about how your family is a really great example of how much Title IX has changed in just one generation, I, I, or how much Title IX has had an impact. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, I fall in the middle of um, two very different generations. And I say that in my mom, you know, attended the University of Iowa 72, 1972 to 1976. And her senior year in high school was the first year that Title IX was enacted. So going, growing up, she didn't have junior high basketball or soccer or even in high school. And then when she got to college, it was still intramural and recreational uh, type of sports. And then now I look at my daughter and I see so many different opportunities and so many doors that have been opened as a result of the Billie Jean Kings and the Lisa Leslie's and those that came before us that like really fought for us to be able to play and to attend universities and um, to learn the life skills that sports teach you. And so I think just being able to have that unique position, I realized we have so much further to go but we've come so far in 50 years. Yeah, and I know it must've been really special to have your mom in the documentary as well. My mom, just being a part of the documentary, um, she's a picture taker. So she supplied all the videos and all the, the pictures. And um, you know, you really had to make a concerted effort to video then, cause it was like <laughs> the camcorder and all of that. Uh, so for her to have those type of videos of me as a kid and um, just, she encouraged me always and, you know, always told me that I could do anything I set my mind to. And, you know, just to have her a part of this documentary was so important. Yeah, no, it was a great voice. And I, I loved all the footage of you playing basketball with your brothers when you were little and uh, the picture of you when you were hugging the basketball, it was almost as big as you were at that point. Uh, <laughs> it was just some really special and intimate stuff in, in 37 words. Thank you so um, much. There were a ton of trailblazers who appeared in the documentary. You were talking a little bit about them. Uh, the people who were driving forces behind Title IX as we know it today. And so, you know, as a self-described history buff, what was it like to have these women who, who were just so seminal be a part of this project? I did a project on Billie Jean King and <laughs> it was surreal for me to have a documentary of something that she directly opened doors for me and my generation. And then to have her in that documentary and to want, to have her want to be a part of that and to realize that she really has dedicated her entire life to ensuring that young girls have the opportunity through sport to learn life skills. And um, it's surreal. I mean, she, she texted me the other day and I still have to pinch myself because <laughs> I'm a Billie Jean King fan and, you know, always will be. I'm sure now there's a lot of Candace Parker fans who, who are looking up and able to look at these, you know, something that you created that you felt compelled to create uh, that is hopefully teaching them a lot of, of uh, about the history of how we have more equity in sports now. I think it's so important for us to continue those conversations. Um, I definitely want to empower young girls and, and, and women to continue to strive, dream, and understand that they deserve a seat at the table, whether it's swinging a bat, whether it's kicking a soccer ball, or whether it's, you know, 
being at the table that decisions are made, being on the ownership, being um, on boards, different things like that. And, you know, it, it's, it's no secret that in the business world, Fortune 500 companies, a lot of their women leaders played team sports. And so it, it really is crucial in the learning um, as, you know, as you're coming up and learning to work in a team environment and things like that, because I think it equips you for the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. There's so much more that you can take from it, even if you don't pursue sports in a professional sense. Um, Title IX protections obviously cleared the way for women's sports in so many ways. But as we know, with, with everything from pay equity to the kinds of facilities that women get, there's a long way to go to, in terms of reaching gender equity in sports. So what are some of the steps that you'd like to see happen to get there? I think you're in a great place with anything when you're not being reactive, you're being proactive. And I would like to see Title IX be more proactive. Uh, we always focus on college and collegiate and federally funded universities, but there's so many uh, disparities at the grassroots level, at the elementary, at the middle school. Um, and I think that that's when you're seeing young girls, especially dropping out of sports is usually right around puberty, 11 to 13 is when you see the biggest drop off. Why is that? And so what are they being told up into that point? So for me, I would love to see this law be more proactive and um, really empower those that it's, it's, it's trying to protect. And um, usually those voices aren't heard at the elementary and the junior high level when, you know, in the high school level, when those bars are being set that the boys get the new uniforms just because they're boys and the girls get the hand-me-downs and that's not fair and that's not um, how it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think, you know, as you said, you have known about Title IX for a long time. This is something that you've, you've researched a ton and then you made a documentary about it. As you were kind of researching and going through this process, is there anything that you learned in the history or how it's applied even today that really surprised you? The journey of Title IX, the ups and downs. Um, but I also think it's, yes, there's the names. You know, you, 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 you hear the names of the people that have been just behind Title IX. But I think it's the, it's the moms. You know, in my documentary, we were able to touch on a mom that was not okay with her daughter not having a good softball facility to play in. And it's the parents that are the driving force. It's the moms, it's the dads that recognize that their daughters don't have the same opportunities as their sons. And, you know, I am the youngest of three. I have two older brothers and my dad coached all of us. And I think through coaching girls, like he realized, you know, just how awesome and how crucial and how important it is um, for girls to continue to play in team sports. And so I think it's, it's the little steps that I've realized that are really making the biggest difference in bringing about change. I love that part in the documentary where, you know, your, your dad's talking about coaching your brothers and then your mom actually comes on and is like, I wanted to make sure that Candace also got the experience of being coached by her father. And I just thought that it's so true because a lot of times that doesn't even occur um, in, in a lot of those kind of uh, situations for a dad to step in and coach his daughters and rather than sons. It's so important. And um, just in terms of being coached and I was lucky because I attended a university where coach summit said, I'm going to coach you as a basketball player. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so important is sometimes we're so focused on girls and boys and how do you reach them and how do you coach them? And I think I was fortunate in my upbringing. My dad coached me. He coached me as a basketball player and he didn't allow me to put limitations and, you know, put limitations on myself and, you know, same thing at Tennessee uh, with Coach Summit. And so I think it's so important for us to continue to empower young girls and boys not to be professional athletes, um, but to learn the life skills to persevere in life because you're going to have wins and losses in life itself. And, you know, obviously to, to be a good teammate and, and to work in a team setting. Mm -hmm. So equity in sports or even a lack of it extends beyond the, you know, players. So women are underrepresented in so many roles in professional sports, including broadcasts. 
um, you are the only woman, woman studio broadcaster for Turner. And so what does that mean for you to break through in that role? And why do you think that that has been such a barrier for women? Perception is one of those things in our society um, that it takes a long time for change to come. I think it takes one taking a chance and then it's kind of one of those, um, those, those effects that it just has an impact on another organization or um, uh, you know another television company. Um, and for me, I think coming in, just I wanted to talk sports. And I hope that at some point in the future, we're able to really focus on the person that has the job. Because listen, if the criteria is playing in the NBA, there would be a number of broadcasters across the board that would not have a job because they didn't play in the NBA. But we listen to them because they are male. And so I, I guess my goal and my hope is to break down um, that stereotype and um, to continue to do that through sports and through just being out there. I mean, I want to open up the doors for more women to be able to come in and sit at the table and be able to talk sports and um, be respected doing it. Do you think that there, you know, you were touching on something there about, uh, you know, we listen to male broadcasters because they're men, um, even if they weren't a professional athlete or hadn't played in the NBA, NFL, MLB, whatever. Uh, do you think that there in, in general is a, um, kind of bias toward men being able to be experts on subjects where, where women typically aren't allowed to? hundred percent. And, um, I think that growing up, my parents told me that I have to be 10 times more prepared because I am an African-American woman and I held on to that. But also I think going in, I want to make this clear. I don't try to be one of the guys. And I've said this a number of times. I try to be one of the players. I'm a basketball player. And I hope at some point, I mean, my hope for my, my daughter and my son's generation is that when they walk into the room, the best person um, gets the job. And I want to be judged. If you don't like me, I think it's evident in social media and in that kind of um, environment. If you don't like me, don't like me because of my viewpoint, but don't dislike me because I'm a woman or because I am black. And I think that that's the major thing that we have to get past um, is that if you are male, you are right. If you are a woman, you have to be, you have to prove that you're right. And, um, you know, I, I just hope that through the Robin Roberts, through, you know, a uh, number of women that are on television broadcasting and doing an amazing job. I hope we're able to continue to open doors and to continue to change perceptions. You mentioned your, your daughter and I actually wanted to ask um, about her. I was curious if you think by the time going back to Title IX uh, that she's college age, if there are going to be notable changes in Title IX, what Title IX protections could do for her that maybe weren't even afforded to you? My daughter's 13, and I hope in five years we're able to um, continue to strive to do better. Um, I believe in pivotal moments. You know, we had a pivotal moment in 2020 as a country where we had to, you know, come together and look ourselves in the mirror and face race, right? And I think within women's sports, we had a pivotal moment in 2021 where we had to come together and look and see the inequities in our face through an Instagram post. We were able through Sedona who posted the women's weight room. And I think everybody in women's sports was not surprised by that. We weren't surprised. We were actually surprised that people were surprised. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because of that, we've had some changes being made, but just as in 2020, people's you know, attention goes elsewhere. It's the same thing with women's sports. It's a hot topic. And then you have to fight to keep it a hot topic. And I think that that's the biggest thing now we're making strides, but are we gonna to continue to make those strides? And I hope in five years, we're able to sit here and still the WNBA is continuing to expand and grow as well as women in sports and the inequities, especially with the NCAA and their treatment of facilities, their treatment of players, um, just across the board. And I think NIL, social media, all of those things are helping to level the playing field because you can no longer now just say, 
well, women can't sell. When you look at Paige Beckers and she has a million plus followers and on overtime, she gets, you know, a certain amount of hits and then her male counterpart doesn't. So I think now social media is actually going to really, you know, put title nine to the fire because it's proving, you know, monetarily that women can sell and, you know, women's sports sells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, because that is the classic argument, right? Is, Is that, well, you know, it's not that we don't care about women's sports is that we're investing in ways that things that are already profitable. Um, and so it's interesting to hear your take on that with social media, because that's like taking it and taking it out of kind of TV metrics and putting it sort of directly in the hands of people, right? It's putting it directly in the hands of people, but it's also um, in brands proving, you know, numbers and showing you statistics. I mean, we live in an analytical world where it's analytics, analytics, analytics. Well, here they are. And now we're able to track how much is sold. Now we're able to track that women do sell shoes because guess what? Women usually are the people that are buying within the household. Um, There is a market. Is it a different market for men's sports? Yes, but there is a market where women sports and women's shoes can sell. And, you know, it's being proven now through social media, through followers and, you know, through, through brands being able to get those statistics. So you've just started your 15th WNBA season, Um, but so congratulations first off, Um, obviously a huge force on the court, Uh, but so it's one of your first seasons or or your first season playing after coming out. And I'd be, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how the WNBA has shown up um, for its queer players. Well, first, I think it's so important to recognize that in the WNBA, Um, we are the majority of the minority in this country. And I say that in the sense of we are a league of women. Um, We are predominantly African-American. We come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, different communities. And I think with that being said, um, we feel a need to represent those communities through our voices. We feel like we wanna be those voices for those that feel like they're not heard. And with that being said, I think there's a number of things across the board that the WNBA does a phenomenal job um, to bring attention to, um, to raise up, to empower. And it's because we represent that. And, um, you know, I think everybody wants to feel supported, you know, and it's so important that we continue to support individuals that may not do things that you know, are the status quo or, you know, have a different point of view. Uh, And I think the WNBA has done a great job of that. The WNBA, I I think in so many ways has led, uh, put a blueprint out for athletes in other leagues. You know, the NBA, I think is really the most influenced in terms of activism and using voices and seeing people, uh, people as people and not just as a basketball player, right? Um, somebody who has an opinion, who, who wants to put their voice to something. Um, and it, it's just very striking to me because I think that it's a lot of that, the, the activism that we've seen from players has originated from the WNBA. It's originated and I think it's been authentic within it, regardless, um, you know, obviously we understand the attention that the NBA gets and that is great, especially for causes that we support and causes that we kind of connect with them with. Um, but the WNBA has always kind of had their feet on the, on the ground and have fought. Um, and so I think just the authenticity of the moment really showed and I think people gravitated towards that. And anytime you're able to, you know, have the mic and have the moment, use it to uplift others. And that's what the WNBA is about. And I hope that's what we continue to be about. Absolutely. Well, ahead of this season, you said that this could also be your last season. Uh, Now that we've got things underway, I I'd just love to get an update on that status. You know, I'm one of those people that I'm not probably going to have a tour. I'm not the one that's going to announce, you know, ahead of the season. Uh, For me, 
I always said, I'm going to wake up and know. And in the off season, you know, my family and I, for the last four or five years have made that decision together collectively, whether it's for the best for all of us, for me to play. And so, you know, obviously I know there's a lot more basketball behind me than in front of me. <laughs> I can tell you that for sure. But in terms of this being my last year, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how the off season goes. And, um, you know, I think that that's a question. I mean, maybe I'll play, you know, five more years. Maybe I'll play one. Who knows? Well, Candace, thank you so much for being here with me today. Uh, you know, again, in the middle of the season with a newborn at home. Um, but we really appreciate the time. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.